starts right now. Believe it. When you stay home and you don't go out and interact with other people, you are saving lives. Life-saving advice tonight from an infectious disease doctor. As we near another round of shutdowns in San Antonio, less movement means less chance for spread. Let's take a look at the latest number of COVID-19 cases in Bear County. So far, a total of 57 cases. 28 are travel related. Seven were spread through close contact with someone who previously tested positive. 16 are community spread and the source of exposure for six cases still under investigation tonight. The county's first death was reported yesterday. According to city officials, the woman in her 90 or in her 80s, excuse me, had underlying health conditions. And at Joint Base San Antonio Lackland, at least 15 personnel have tested positive so far. That does not include the evacuees that were taken to that base. Stay home, save lives. That's the emergency declaration by Bear County and San Antonio leaders as they announce a stay home, work safe order. It's an effort to help contain COVID-19, which is already spreading in our community. First responders, medical personnel, and essential businesses are exempt. The night team's Patty Santos tells us who this order specifically impacts. This is not complicated, people. Stay home, save lives. The city of San Antonio and Bear County are ordering residents to hunker down as COVID-19 spreads in our community. Non-essential businesses will be forced to shut down starting Tuesday at midnight until April 9th. Exemptions are made for some, including healthcare workers, first responders, those in government functions, education personnel, financial institutions, child care services, hotels, and home maintenance type services like plumbing and electricians. We're telling people um, that you must go home. If unless you're engaged in an essential activity, you must go home. It doesn't matter what time of day it is. Judge Nelson Wolf says it's a preventative effort to help our hospitals handle the peak that's coming. In our region eight, which includes 28 counties, he explains there are some 3,700 hospital beds. About 800 of those are isolated beds, and there are only four to 500 ventilators available. That will help us if we keep this flat. But if we don't keep it flat and we don't take preventive measures, then it's going to spike up and they're not going to be able to handle it. Residents say the full stay at home order will change things. Families are just uh, trying to take care of themselves. Officials say most area residents and businesses have complied with the orders given so far. Others question the need for such restrictions. Really, this is all too much of a hype. There probably is a percentage of people that may not or do, won't choose not to comply or try not to comply, I'm sure. but. Um, if they tell you, tell us to stay at home or tell me to stay at home, I guess I've got to stay at home. If somebody's going from one place to another, they should be going home unless they're going to an essential service. And again, grocery stores, gas stations and pharmacies, they're all still open. Outdoor activities are limited, but also still allowed. If you want to read the specifics on this order, head to KSAT.com. Patty Santos, KSAT 12 News. Is it hype? Why is it so important that people stay home? Well, that decision was one the mayor and county judge said they decided on with input from the medical community, and they gave business leaders the heads up on their emergency declaration. The stay at home idea mirrors decisions made in other communities across Texas and the country. Dr. Ruth Bergeron is an infectious disease doctor at UT Health San Antonio's Long School of Medicine. She applauds the mayor and county judge's decision. I know this is dire. It's difficult for everybody. These are extraordinary times. We've never lived through times like these. But if we do nothing, we know for sure we're going to have rapid community spread and overwhelming our hospital system. So believe it. When you stay home and you don't go out and interact with other people, you are saving lives. We talked to Dr. Berger and during the KSAT News at 9. She is asking people to be kind to one another as well. She says there are a lot of things with this virus that people can't control, but our attitudes towards each other is something we can. She's been advising the county on steps to take to take to battle the coronavirus locally. And you heard her say she's especially worried about the county's health care system being overrun if the number of cases continues to grow.
That's one of the reasons she and other doctors are asking for the community support. Tomorrow and Wednesday, UT Health San Antonio is asking for your help collecting as much protective gear as possible to be given to their health care providers. Most needed are face masks, including N95 respirators, surgical masks and masks used by painters, carpenters or hobbyists. They're also accepting unused medical or disposable gloves, eye protection goggles, face shields, and thermometers. You can drop off items from 7 a.m. until 6 p.m. at UT Health San Antonio. You're asked to head to the entry station near the intersection of Floyd Curl and Medical Drive, and you'll be directed from there. Running at maximum capacity. That's how Assistant City Manager Dr. Colleen Bridger describes her staff's response to COVID-19. Officials have still not released the name or exact age of an area woman who died over the weekend from complications of COVID-19. Dr. Bridger says public awareness about COVID-19 is prioritized over releasing specific information about the victims. Bridger said her current priorities are to stop the spread of COVID-19, make sure a health care system, make sure the health care system remains stable and keeping everyone briefed on the latest information. A testing task force is now meeting every other day and private labs have been briefed on how to report both negative and positive results back to Metro Health. Eventually, the city plans to map out the hot spots where people tested positive in Bear County. The coronavirus also impacting the way veterans are buried and honored. All departments of Veterans Affairs National Cemeteries will adjust operations in response to COVID-19. At Fort Sam Houston National Cemetery, new guidelines were implemented today. Tiffany Huertas reports that includes suspending funeral honors and large gatherings. She was married to my father who was in the army. Rebecca Redding came to visit her mother Monday afternoon at Fort Sam Houston National Cemetery. Rebecca says she can't believe the changes the cemetery has put in place. If this was going on, my dad passed away, God forbid, tomorrow, I would, would be very upset not having him honored in the way that he would want to be honored. Funeral homes will come out and then we'll take over uh, custody of the remains and then we complete the interment process. This will be the only way those who served our country will be laid to rest at Fort Sam Houston National Cemetery until further notice. We're currently not holding committal services at our shelters for uh, family members to attend. As part of federal efforts to limit the spread of coronavirus, large committal services and military burial honors will come to a stop at veteran cemeteries. Currently our volunteer honor guard, uh, they are uh, VA volunteers and they currently are not rendering honors because we're not having any committal services at our shelters. Uh, we're doing this to protect not only the, the funeral homes and the families, but our volunteers and our staff as well. The cemetery will remain open for visitations. The director of Fort Sam Houston National Cemetery says they're following guidelines from the CDC. So even though we're open and, and for visitation and, and the community is more than welcome to come out and visit their loved ones grave sites, we just want them to stay stay safe and uh, minimize the travel if they can. Cemetery Director Aubrey David says even if families choose to have a person buried right now, they can schedule full service at a later date. I think for our national cemeteries, it's our job to uh, provide dignified, respectful burials for our veterans, and I'm just glad that we're able to remain open and continue to provide those services. Tiffany Huertas, KSAT 12 News. Now, families may request to view the burial, but they will be kept at a safe distance with no more than 10 immediate family members. As Tiffany mentioned, the U.S. Department of Veteran Affairs says families can postpone a currently scheduled burial to a later date. If they are on the front lines when it comes to confronting COVID-19, doctors and nurses helping patients with the virus and in other emergencies. Governor Greg Abbott is putting certain nursing students on a fast track to jump in and help as the needs grow. The night team's Jaffe Gray spoke with one nursing student who wants to help her community. I think that our community needs all hands on deck and I'm I'm ready. I'm ready for the call for it. San Antonio College nursing student Jasmine McGill says she's fired up to serve after Governor Greg Abbott's recent announcement to waive regulations to address the potential shortage of nurses because of the coronavirus pandemic. This will allow temporary permit extensions to practice for graduate nurses and graduate vocational nurses who have yet to take 
the nursing licensing exam. McGill says these types of nurses will potentially be handling basic activities to care for the patient, but she says it will help out tremendously. We would be doing things like toileting, ambulating our patients. We can measure INO. We can do a lot of these critical tasks that help take a lot of time away from the healthcare workers that are experienced and seasoned and the veterans that are on the floor. McGill has been busy completing her clinicals at home through an e-learning online experience because of the coronavirus. The hospitals had to kick us out as students because we're more we're, we're another large body that could be a possible exposure to the patients. Governor Abbott also announced retired nurses will also be able to reactivate their licenses to help. I think it's kind of cool. That's like asking Rocky Balboa to come back to the game. You know, it's it's their veterans, they're seasoned and they're the most knowledgeable and a lot of these nurses have been around through other smaller pandemics. McGill says she doesn't know when exactly she or her fellow nursing students will be called for action, but she is positive about the future. We're going to come out on top of this and we're going to be around to say, you know what, I helped save those lives. Jaffany Gray, KSAT 12 News. A well, major decision tonight, no abortions will be performed in Texas unless the mother's life is in danger. Officials say it's being done in an effort to preserve medical resources for COVID-19 patients. Texas Attorney General Ken Paxton made the announcement today, one day after Governor Greg Abbott ordered health care facilities to postpone procedures deemed not medically necessary. CEOs from the three Planned Parenthood facilities in Texas say they're reviewing the governor's executive order regarding hospital capacity. A joint statement reads in part, quote, the priority of all Planned Parenthood health centers in Texas is the health and safety of our patients and staff and ensuring the Texans can, ex can access essential health care, including abortion, end quote. The coronavirus delaying a decision on the city's request to move the cenotaph that sits near the Alamo. The Texas Historical Commission set to hold a meeting tomorrow and another on Wednesday to discuss the matter. That's been pushed back. That quarterly meeting has now been postponed until further notice. As a matter of fact, the commission asked the city to give more information on the project, including more explanation on why it should be moved and a list of any potential alternate sites where that monument could be placed. He's still ahead in our one hour long night beat. We've been following his story since he was held in self quarantine. Our case hat team member finally heading home. The new friend made in an uphill battle to get back to San Antonio coming up and our community rallying behind a birthday celebration amid the coronavirus pandemic the drive by birthday bash coming up and the latest in a deadly officer involved shooting in San Antonio next on the night beat. a man with a pick pickaxe shot and killed. San Antonio police say it started as a call for a family disturbance. Officers reported to a home on the 500 block of Glendale Avenue just before four o'clock this morning. Police say a man holding a pickaxe confronted the officers and was shot in the upper torso. An identity has not been released. The officer who pulled the trigger is a two year veteran with SAPD and will be on administrative duty pending an investigation. As the coronavirus crisis grows and more people lose their jobs, the San Antonio State Hospital is in need of help, and they want people to know they're hiring. With almost 100 positions waiting to be filled, those include nursing, facility maintenance, housekeeping, food service, and much more. The hospital offers employees free health insurance and a 50% discounted premium for dependents. That's in addition to free training, competitive salaries, and 12 days of vacation and sick leave. Well, night beat update tonight about our KSAT tech team member who has been stuck in Argentina amid the coronavirus pandemic. After finishing his quarantine, Sebastian Hovell was able to get on a plane and is heading to Chile, where he will then fly to Atlanta and eventually to San Antonio. A long journey, but one he tells the night team's Courtney Friedman almost didn't happen at all. He's been sitting at the airport in Buenos Aires for two days after his original flight got canceled. Some people around him have been waiting for four days to get flights out, and the tension was high. Sebastian sent us this picture of a quarter of a sandwich, the first thing he'd eaten in a day, saying the airport vending machines ran out of food for a while. Coincidentally, he met a man from Dallas named Jerry, also an IT worker trying to get home. What are the odds? They teamed up to speak with the airlines about getting on the next flight and left 
Luckily, they did. They took off around 7 p.m. Texas time, 9 p.m. Argentina time. It'll be a long trip home, but he's keeping his family, work family, and tacos in mind. Courtney Friedman. All right, a bit new emergency declarations. It was a simple post to Facebook, which allowed one San Antonio mother to still throw her now 12 year old daughter, Araceli, a surprise birthday party. Veronica Alonzo reached out through social media to friends and family asking if they could simply drive by their home and shout birthday wishes from their vehicles, maybe honk. All of that happening this afternoon. I was just hoping that friends and family could swing by just to wish her a happy birthday and just know that she's loved out there and cared about uh, even under these circumstances. Araceli a bit shy earlier when we spoke with her, but told our crew she was excited to have the chance to still see friends and family, even though they were just passing by. And from all of us here at KSAT 12, happy birthday to Araceli. Yeah. That's a great little event that they had there for her. Very creative. I love it. Yeah. Wish absolutely. a happy birthday. And, you know, we're thinking of so many people. We were talking about the, mm -hmm. the healthcare industry, yeah. of course, but, you know, there are truck drivers out there and there are, you know, janitors and, and so many people that are working right now to help out in so many different ways. Wish we could mention them all. Yeah, and a, a huge thank you. I think about Absolutely. them throughout my day. Yeah, 72 degrees out there, and uh, weather's changing. It is changing, right? Uh, the weather is going to be up and down a bit for the rest of this week and into the upcoming weekend. So we have a lot to talk about here. And let's start with a look at our weather headlines and just lay it all out there for you. Thick fog returns later tonight. It's going to hang around through the first part of the day tomorrow. And then so far, the hottest temperatures Yet this year, actually the warmest we've seen basically since October is going to be hitting us in just a few days. Then another cold front pays us a visit and switches everything up again. Right now we're at 72 southeasterly breeze at 10. That gives us our dew point of 66. So yeah, you notice the mugginess out there today. Everybody's feeling the humidity dew points right now in the 60s. So we're in the muggy category. Most wouldn't call it oppressive at this point. And something interesting is going to happen tomorrow. We'll have the nice little dry line come in from West Texas. Often it gets hung up in the hill country. And hill country sees a little drop in their humidity for the afternoon. But it looks like the West Texas dry line is going to pay us a visit tomorrow and actually make it to the I-35 corridor and give us a nice dip in our dew points and a lack of mugginess in the air for tomorrow afternoon. And that's going to last all the way into Wednesday as well. Temperature wise, the lower 70s along and east of I-35, 72 in Pleasanton, 73 New Braunfels. You get into the hill country and we have some readings in the 60s. Let's talk about the fog. Visibility was way down this morning. It's going to be again tomorrow morning. Here's our future cast that going through time helps us get an idea of what we can anticipate visibility wise. Even by 2 a.m., probably visibility between one and three miles. Then we get to sunrise tomorrow morning. And I think we'll see widespread visibilities less than a mile. So anticipate some thick fog again tomorrow morning. Big difference is I think we'll actually see that fog clear out and sunshine quite a bit sooner than what we had today. By 10, 11 o'clock, that fog really shrinks down and we start to see a lot of sunshine throughout South Texas. So should be a little bit quicker in terms of the blue in our sky. Big blue, speaking of blue, big blue H, it's controlling our weather again. It's that time of year where it starts to really impact our conditions. And that upper level high centered over Mexico, it's going to remain the primary driver of our weather for basically the rest of this work week. So we're looking at the unseasonably warm conditions and high temperatures probably topping out in the lower 90s by Wednesday. But then things change. You get into Friday and especially Saturday, Sunday, our pattern shifts in this upper level system We'll pull a cold front through town and that's going to cool us off for the upcoming weekend again. So starting at 7 a.m. tomorrow, 67 by noon, 80 right near 90 for the high temperature. If we actually hit it, it'll be the first time yet this year, but lower humidity for the second part of the day. Hot but not humid on Wednesday, 92 sunny, lack of humidity and still right near 90 degrees with a lot of sunshine Thursday and Friday. But then look at the weekend. We plummet back down into the 70s with the mixture of sun and clouds. So big changes coming. Yeah, and 70s not bad. All right, thanks so much, Adam. All right, with apologies to James Harden and, you know, 
the other great beards out there. This guy, for my yeah. money, had the best beard in sports. Travis Frederick, who is the anchor of the Dallas Cowboys offensive line, arguably the best offensive line for a number of years in the NFL, is retiring. Why is he retiring now at just the age of 29? When we come back, you will hear why, plus reaction from Jerry Jones, the Cowboys owner, and Deshaun Watson responding to the DeAndre Hopkins trade, and it's very strange coming up. Pro football coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. Shocking news coming out of Dallas today as the Cowboys reveal their Pro Bowl and All-Pro center Travis Frederick has decided to announce his retirement at just the age of 29. Frederick had been the best at his position for the Dallas Cowboys for the last seven seasons after the Cowboys made him a first-round draft pick in 2013. He started every game at center in his first five seasons before he had to sit out the entire 2018 season after suffering from a syndrome that attacks the nervous system. But he did return to start every game last year before announcing his retirement today, admitting the competitor in him would not allow him to go out without returning for at least one more season. Travis did release this statement on social media today, and it says in part, and we're quoting, this was not an easy decision. I entered the league at 22 years old, unsure of where life would lead. I since have married, welcomed two beautiful, healthy children into this world and achieved professional levels of which I could have never dreamed. When I developed Guillain-Barre syndrome, I did not know how to handle things. I was scared. That experience forced me to reevaluate my life priorities. I'm very lucky to have played my entire career for and with the greatest sports franchise and fan base in the world. Now, Jerry Jones released a statement tonight to follow that up with. His leadership, ability, production, and intelligence put him at the top level of interior offensive linemen in our league for many years. At the pinnacle of his success, his career on the field was only exceeded by a rare display of courage and determination in overcoming a life-threatening illness and returning to the game, a challenge that could only be completed by a person with rare levels of perseverance and strength. Randy Gregory, the Dallas Cowboys defensive end who has been suspended indefinitely by the NFL back in February 2019 has applied for reinstatement. Now that's according to ESPN that says his application to return to play in the NFL starts a clock on a 60-day time period for Commissioner Roger Goodell to make a decision. Gregory was suspended all of last season after multiple violations of the league's substance abuse policy that date all the way back to 2015 when the Cowboys made Gregory a second round draft pick. Gregory has admitted to marijuana use to fight off anxiety issues but now due to the new collective bargain agreement, a player can no longer be suspended for marijuana use, but Gregory was suspended under the old agreement, so it would still be up to the commissioner. Dallas Cowboys are also in talks with free agent defensive tackle Don Terry Poe after he spent time with the Carolina Panthers for the last two years. That's according to the NFL Network. The Cowboys have already signed Gerald McCoy to a three-year contract, and now he could be reunited with his old Carolina teammate. Another defensive lineman the Cowboys have their eye on right now is Indomitian Sue. Sue played five seasons for the Detroit Lions, where his Suiting up for the Miami Dolphins, then one year each for the Rams in Tampa Bay. He has only missed two games his entire career. It does not appear that Deshaun Watson is a fan of the controversial trade that sent his star wide receiver DeAndre Hopkins to the Arizona Cardinals for running back David Johnson and draft picks. And that should be a red flag to head coach and general manager Bill O'Brien, who made the deal that most Texans fans can't believe, especially since it did not include a number one draft pick for Hopkins. And even more so, that Watson has one more year remaining on his rookie contract, will be up for a contract contract extension sooner than later. This is what Watson posted on Twitter, even though he says it's lyrics from a Drake song. I don't know how I'm going to make it out of here clean. Can't even keep track of who plays for other team. Iconic duels rip and split at the seams. P.J. Walker becomes the first XFL player to sign with an NFL team since the league announced he was shutting down the rest of the season due to coronavirus. Now, Walker was one of the top players in the XFL in its restart, leading the Houston Roughnecks to a 5-0 start by throwing for a league-leading 1 1,338 yards and 15 touchdowns. By signing with Carolina, Parker is now reunited with his old college, Matt, college coach, I should say, Matt Rule, who was at Temple before being brought to Baylor. In 2015 and 2016, Parker helped lead the Owls to back-to-back 10 -back seasons and leads the school in record. The Panthers going through a major transition at quarterback after signing Teddy Bridgewater and telling Cam Newton he can look for a trade. As a result of that move, the Panthers are trading former Aggie quarterback Kyle Allen to the Washington Redskins for a fifth round pick. Allen started 12 games last season for Carolina with Cam Newton sideline with injuries. Now he gives Washington a backup for Dwayne Haskins. The Olympics postponed next. 
The 2020 Olympics in Tokyo have been postponed more than likely until 2021 due to the concerns over the coronavirus. That's according to USA Today and International Olympic Committee member Dick Pound. Pound telling USA Today the decision was made based on the information the IOC has. It also follows Canada's decision to not send athletes to Japan unless the summer games were postponed. That and Norway call for a postponement. So as Portugal and Australia has told its athletes to be prepared for the games to be postponed until next year. That has now become a fact with an official announcement to come yet from the IOC. IOC. This follows the IOC's announcement over the weekend that they would make a final decision in four weeks and that canceling the games was not an option. Charles Barkley has tested negative for having the coronavirus as after Barkley had traveled to New York, which is one of the hot spots early this month. And when he returned to Atlanta, did not feel well. Only today he said he did get the results of the test and they were negative for COVID-19. So that is good news to hear. We hope we hear that more often than not coming forward. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you, Greg. It's still ahead. She's been in San Antonio for the past eight months, but the coronavirus pandemic forcing her to go home to the Ukraine her experience and her dream to return coming up plus a local distillery shifting its use of alcohol during the coronavirus pandemic and frustrations growing over the nearly two trillion dollar stimulus bill plus the warning a hospital memo is sending to its medical staff next on the night beat With the number of confirmed cases of novel coronavirus rising sharply across America, more states issuing new orders and millions are staying home. In the epicenter of New York, a major convention center is now becoming a hospital. And in Washington, negotiations are still underway on a massive stimulus package. ABC's Trevor Alt has the latest. Tonight, one in four Americans is staying at home. At least 17 states have imposed restrictions, closing businesses, forcing people to work from home, or forcing them out of jobs altogether. In some locations, law enforcement threatening to crack down on people who ignore the warnings to stay apart. Certainly, this is going to be bad, and we're trying to make it uh, so that it's much, much less bad. Treating those who are already sick is in many cases leading to a shortage of supplies. The chief of surgery at Columbia University warning in a memo to staff the hospital is burning through 40,000 masks every day when on a normal day they'd use just 4,000. Am I going to run into this room to save this patient or am I going to take the time to try and scramble and find a mask? With more than 20,000 people infected in New York State, New York City's Javits Center, the city's convention facility now being turned into a hospital. While on the way to New York, a Navy hospital ship is expected to soon depart. And across the country, the Mercy has already left port on its way to Los Angeles. In Washington, growing frustration over the nearly two trillion dollar stimulus bill now blocked twice by Democrats who say it puts big business ahead of American workers. And President Trump perhaps growing impatient with the country shutting down, saying America cannot let the cure be worse than the problem itself. America will again and soon be open for business uh, very soon, a lot sooner than uh, three or four months that somebody was suggesting. Here in New York, they're moving forward with trials for a new drug therapy the president has been pushing, the anti-malaria drug hydroxychloroquine, and antibiotics usually referred to as a Z-Pak. The president says they could be a game changer, but any effectiveness is still unproven. Trevor Ault, ABC News, New York. Convicted sex offender Harvey Weinstein has tested positive for COVID-19. That's according to the head of the New York State Corrections Officers Union. He said Weinstein's test was conducted at a correctional facility near Buffalo, where he's currently being held. He is now in isolation. Weinstein was sentenced to 23 years in prison earlier this month for rape and criminal sexual acts involving two women. But before his transfer, he was held in Rikers Island Jail, where a prison that is where the virus has infected both inmates and staff. Senator Rand Paul, who has tested positive for COVID-19, is defending his decision not to self quarantine after learning he was exposed. The senator says he didn't meet the threshold for getting tested for coronavirus. He says he felt fine and thought the test was just a precaution. He says that's why he didn't think he needed to self quarantine. Republican senators Mitt Romney and Mike Lee of Utah are now in self quarantine after interacting 
with Paul. Senator Amy Klobuchar announced today her husband tested positive for COVID-19. On Twitter, the former presidential candidate wrote her husband was admitted to a Virginia hospital and now has pneumonia and is on oxygen, but not a ventilator. Klobuchar said he has been cut off from all visitors and she has not been able to see him during this time. Klobuchar says she has not seen him in two weeks, so she has not been advised to get a test. She said she and her daughter are talking to him on the phone and through text message. Over the past several days, we've been inundated with messages from you, our viewers, about price gouging at local stores, including one store we featured last night on the night beat. But how widespread is the problem? The defenders Tim Gerber asked the state attorney general's office to find out. I was very disappointed that we were being accused of that. Local grocer Juan Canedo spent much of his weekend doing damage control after a customer online accused him of price gouging. The post went viral, and it wasn't the only one. Several viewers sent us pictures of what they thought were other stores taking advantage of an emergency situation. But is that really what's happening? Their margin is staying the same. There's not any price gouging. It's just that the cost to acquire those goods has now suddenly gone up. Invoices shared by the store show they paid $11 for a case of Disney character water bottles. They sold them for $11.75. It's way below our normal markup. 75 cents for the $11 is less than 8% markup. Small stores are also having to find non-traditional vendors to keep their shelves stocked. Instead of selling eggs by the dozen, they're now selling them in trays of 30 from a new vendor, which costs more. We paid uh, $14.99. That was our cost, $14.99 on March 10th. And then in, in 10 days, our price doubled in 10 days. And so our co costs reflected that. The state and local authorities take price gouging very seriously. So far, the state attorney general's office says they've received more than 1,500 complaints related to the current disaster declaration. More than 1,400 of those complaints were alleged price gouging. Those complaints are currently being investigated, and most of them have come in from Houston and Dallas. If price gouging is confirmed, those responsible may have to reimburse the customer and could be liable for civil penalties up to $10,000 per violation and up to $250,000 if the consumers are elderly. But if the allegations are unfounded? Well, it can be incredibly damaging because, you know, small stores like this, once something gets viral out on Facebook and on social media, it can be devastating to their reputation. That was the Defenders' Tim Gerber reporting. Now, if you suspect price gouging, ask the store owner to explain the price increase. If you believe they're still charging too much, call the AG's office to file a complaint or call your local authorities. And remember, be careful when sharing information you find on social media. We here at KSAT have started something called the Trust Index for exactly these kind of stories. And in this time when there is so much information out there concerning COVID-19 that could be misleading or downright false, we do the fact checking and dig deeper into a story to go beyond the headlines. Well, if you or anyone you know has lost their job because of the coronavirus crisis, several businesses are now hiring extra help. Papa John's is looking to add 20,000 employees. They currently have positions open for restaurant jobs, delivery drivers and more. At most locations, you can apply, interview and even start the same day. Yeah, it doesn't stop there either. CVS also hiring. The company is looking to employ 50,000 more people for full time, part time and temporary positions. It's also stepping up to help its employees who don't have the option of working from home like pharmacists and techs. The company announced it will give $500 bonuses to its employees who have to be there during this pandemic. Finally, grocery delivery service Instacart plans to hire at least 300,000 full service shoppers who are treated as independent contractors. This comes as demand surges for grocery deliveries. The hiring will take place across the next three months. A Ukrainian foreign exchange student who's been studying in Jordanson for eight months is headed home early because of the coronavirus pandemic. She was chosen out of thousands for a competitive exchange program, and she's sad to leave. The night team's Courtney Friedman spoke to her about her experience in America and her dream to return one day to go to college. 
Decked out in Jordanton High School gear, 15-year-old Ukrainian student Ala Mueller fits right in, something that was tough at first when she started her foreign exchange program. It's really, really hard to live far away from your parents. But it didn't take long for her to flourish, becoming close with her host family and even dating a new boyfriend. We were supposed to have our, like, six-month anniversary, I guess, like on 25th of April. And we were supposed to go to prom together. But plans are cut short. She's been here for eight months. Her program's supposed to end in June. But her parents are worried about the coronavirus and she's heading home early. They don't know if the program itself will be able to give us any flights later. She'll fly home Thursday, just a week before her 16th birthday. When I was a kid, I watched a Disney movie where the girl had like 16 candles. And I don't remember the name of it. It was like 16 wishes or something. And it happened in America, so it was like a dream to have my 16th birthday in America. As for what she'll miss most about America? Honestly, I think it's going to be food. <laughs> I think it's going to be Subway for sure. I, I like. I literally want to uh, send an email to Subway and ask them to open in Ukraine. She hopes to come back to the U.S. for college. For me, American colleges are always were like something you can that you can see only in the movies, you know. Yeah. Yeah, and I think it's just such an amazing experience. Plus, I really love education here. Like, a lot of students from America, they don't like school, but I actually enjoy going to school here. Like, I love it. She'll miss Texas, but says she is excited to see her family back in Ukraine. Courtney Friedman, KSAT 12 News. Oh, and we wish her well. Absolutely. Meantime, Oprah Winfrey is launching a new series on the coronavirus pandemic. The series is called Oprah Talks COVID-19. It's streaming now and can be viewed on Apple TV Plus with or without a subscription. In her first episode, Oprah spoke with actor Idris Elba, who's tested positive, and his wife about how they're meeting the challenges of self-quarantine. Tinder is temporarily offering its passport service for free so people can connect with each other despite social distancing. Passport allows people who use the dating app to change their locations. That way they can start conversations with people who live in other states or other countries. It's usually a paid service, but Tinder says it might help people connect with each other when they're stuck at home. And I want to let you know about a scam alert tonight. Scammers are out to get unsuspecting victims during the coronavirus pandemic. Scammers are sending people fake Starbucks social distancing gift cards on behalf of the company. If you receive a gift card or a coupon, you're asked to contact the Starbucks customer care line, visit their website, or check their app to verify any promotions. Remember to never transfer money onto a gift card over the phone and don't hand out personal information. Still ahead on the night beat amid the coronavirus crisis, a local brewery is shifting from producing beer to a more helpful kind of alcohol. Plus, nothing says romance these days like a bouquet made of toilet paper. <laughs> How a local flower shop is doing its part to help. If you've been on the hunt for hand sanitizer, by now you might have noticed store shelves have been completely wiped out. It's why Ranger Creek Brewery is working with alcohol in a different way. The brewery and distillery is making it its very own hand sanitizer and they're giving it out to anyone who needs it for free. Head distiller Josh Gardner says he had to close up last week, but then decided to shift gears when the Alcohol, Tobacco, Trade and Tax Bureau announced distilleries could legally produce hand sanitizer. It's a little bit of a change, but uh, we're, uh, we're making it work and uh, helping out the community at the same time. The business worked with the Federal Drug Administration and the World Health Organization to make a new alcohol concoction. The distillery is working on more batches to fulfill bulk orders for organizations and companies. Back here at home, customer demand fueling a flower shop to shift to a new type of bouquet. Instead of flowers, rolls of toilet paper are featured. The flower bucket on West Avenue started creating these bouquets. They are still flowers as part of the arrangements, but toilet paper, the main focus. I mean, everybody's been looking for toilet paper and stuff like that. We have it here in the stores. Um, not as much as we would like to have, but um, we had a customer ask for it and we decided to make it. Snowy, our design manager, um, kind of came up with her own idea of what it could look like. 
I like the idea. I think they're on a roll. <laughs> Customers can call the flower bucket for their curbside service, but you may want to act fast. It's unclear if the new declaration will impact the flower business. And you may have also heard of a calculator designed to check how many rolls of toilet paper needed during quarantine. The website is howmuchtoiletpaper.com. More than 2 million people have already used the website. Designers hope it will reduce the toilet paper shortage around the world. Yes, they're doing the paperwork for you. <laughs> I like that one. You. On a roll. That was a good one. Steve. That was a really good one. Yeah. Let's take a live look outside with live cam. 72 degrees out there. Very nice day. A little bit on the humid side, though. Yeah, definitely noticing the humidity out there. Right? You'll especially notice it tomorrow morning. Hi. <laughs> and, uh, see, we're still getting used to this whole social distancing. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Tech Technically, it's not what we're used to here. So, uh, But anyway, yeah, you will notice the humidity again first thing tomorrow morning. But I think we'll get a break in it by the afternoon. A little dry line moves through, and we'll have about a 24, 36-hour break from the humidity. But temperatures will be on the rise. Uh, look what was on the rise today. Mold. Our pollen count just contained mold, but very high at over 16,000. It's been damp for several days straight, which is... Okay, it's what we needed. The aquifer responded. It's three feet above average. We put a dent in our drought, but this is always the side effect is high mold counts. Now very high. 80, that was our high temperature today. That's five degrees above average, but far from the record of 96. But this time of year, once you get into the 90s, that's when you start approaching record territory. We were nowhere near that around town today, even cooler in the 70s in parts of the hill country. Uh, even Rock Springs only made it to 68. They were the last to clear out this afternoon. But we'll be, I don't think, close to tying or breaking any records, but getting closer to it within a handful of degrees by the middle part of this week. I mean, we're talking near 90 tomorrow, 92 on Wednesday, 91 on Thursday, first 90 degree days so far this year, and the warmest weather we've had since October. And then into the weekend behind a cold front, See a big dip in those temperatures and we'll be back down into the mid and upper 70s. And that's with some sunshine, too. Right now, we're mostly in the low to mid 70s. Castroville, 75, an even 70 in Bandera. Bolverde, New Braunfels right now at 72. 60s in the hill country and still hanging on to 80 down in Laredo. All right, let's talk about the fog. We're expecting another round later tonight and early tomorrow morning. Probably pretty thick and pretty widespread, partially because of all that thick humidity that you feel outside and all the moisture in the ground, which is nice to have, but it adds to the fog potential. So by sunrise tomorrow, we're looking at visibilities probably under a mile for a good portion of South Texas, and then we'll clear out into the sunshine. And get used to a sunny stretch here this week. Big blue H, big upper level high. That's going to be dominating our weather. Give us unseasonably warm conditions, and that doesn't change until we get into the upcoming weekend as we see a big dip in upper level trough drop in uh, from the west. That's going to cool us down by Saturday. So tomorrow we'll start the day with the morning fog at 67, then make it right about 90 degrees for the high temperature in the afternoon and the wind actually becoming northwesterly to drop the humidity, the humidity by the afternoon. Sunny, warm, but not humid on our Wednesday, 92, and then into the weekend, back down into the 70s. Unfortunately, with that shift in our pattern, doesn't look like a good chance of rain. Mm. All right, thanks so much, Adam. Thank you, Adam. The extended spring break ended for many students. A look at the first day of school for some students and how teachers are showing their students support while keeping their distance. Another week for, for students to learn from home. For many of them, today was the first day of remote or distance learning. Classrooms sit empty at St. Anthony's High School. It's a scene that's familiar for all schools across the state. Microphones and computers are keeping students and teachers connected, but there are challenges. They're worrying about things that we really, we don't have answers to yet about, um, you know, what graduation is gonna look like or advanced placement testing. And all in all, students are being reminded that this is something new for everyone and to be patient because this is a process they will take one day at a time. Is social distancing not so great when it comes to kids and their education and the bonds they have with their teachers? Some teachers on the far northwest side letting their students know that bond is still there and strong as ever while keeping their distance. 
Photojournalist Luis Cienfuegos shows us what that gesture meant to one mother and her twin sons. Oh, look. Hello. Wow, it just keeps going. I know. Woo! Who's the leader? Um, that's a librarian, I think. They're doing the parade through the neighborhood so that kids are able to... We miss y'all. We miss you. Physically see their teachers with still keeping respect to the whole social distancing. It's really nice for them to do that, to take the time to do that. And it's good for the kids to still be able to connect with them and see them and just know that the teachers feel that it's important to them. Look at we miss you guys. All of your teachers have passed by, all of y'all's past teachers. It makes it feel like we're all kind of in the same place. So it's not just a family here or there. There's lots of kids in the neighborhood, so it's nice to see that they're all ready and willing to connect with the teachers. We're all kind of feeling the same want to uh, see each other because that's our norm. Hello. Right now we've been taken so far out of our norm to be able to see each other in person is something that's great. Oh, what a cute finale. <laughs> oh, I love it. Reaching out to their yes. students. Up next, how your kids could receive a message from their friendly neighborhood Spider-Man. We've seen people putting up Christmas lights amid the coronavirus in St. Louis, Missouri. Kevin Werner decided to take more holidays into account. He added decorations for Thanksgiving, American flags for the 4th of July, pumpkins for Halloween. He even threw in an old sink to get people to remember to wash their hands. <laughs> And finally, that's very creative. Finally tonight, keeping spirits up during this coronavirus crisis is cru crucial, especially for kids stuck at home. So how about a message from Spider-Man? Actor Jake Johnson voices Peter Parker in Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse. Right now, he says families can request he send their kids an encouraging voice message. They just have to email Peter B. Parker says hi at gmail.com. They can catch him on the web, maybe. Yeah. You're on a roll. Yes, that's my <laughs> GMSA at 4.30 in the morning. Good night. Nightline is next.